We're going to begin. I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center. We're, we're really pleased to be doing this event this afternoon. And for me, it's a particularly a pleasure, and I think for the center, a pleasure and an honor to have with us Rafael Fernandez de Castro. Uh, Rafael Fernandez de Castro is a professor at ITAM in Mexico City. Uh, he is the founder and was the chair of the Center for International Relations at ITAM. A decade ago, he was a co-founder uh, and co-chair of the U.S.-Mexico Futures Forum along with Berkeley. Uh, he served in the Calderon administration as a senior advisor on foreign affairs. Uh, he is now back at ITAM. Uh, he is also not simply a professor and someone who has engaged in government in a very important way, but he's also someone who is, in my view, one of Mexico's most noted public intellectuals. He is an observer and an actor on important issues that face the country, uh, and he has developed a well-deserved reputation for his candor and his insight on a range of issues that are particularly critical for Mexico. He's going to be speaking on President Calderon's foreign policy, on Mexico and the world today, and then we'll have time to have questions and comments after his talk. So please join me in welcoming Rafael Fernandez. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. I uh, I just uh, spoke to some students in the class, and I was telling them, and I will tell you all of you, some of of the students are here, that I truly appreciate uh, you being here because it's such a lovely day. <laughs> that, uh, so I'm going to do my best to entertain you. You know, I I just realized that I I, I wrote my, what I was going to say in the plane because I, I catch a plane very early this morning. Of, co of course, I didn't print it, what I, I was going to say, but I, I, I know what I want to say, and, and I want to be... Uh, 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 what I want to do is basically to, to tell you a little bit about which were the, the most important challenges uh, in world affairs for President Calderon, and what I consider to be, to continue to be the single most important challenge Yes, for, for Mexico nowadays. Uh, we're having an election next year. I will finish uh, uh, in talking to you about the election next year, who the candidates are, and what are the possibilities of, 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 of one of those candidates becoming president of Mexico. Uh, let me start by, by saying that I would say the number one, number two, number three priority for Mexico, for Mexican foreign policy, it's the US. It's, there's no other a country as, as important as the U.S. for Mexico. By all means, this is the single most important country for Mexico for many reasons, and uh, historical, current affairs, and the future, I mean, we're uh, tied to each other. Uh, and uh, let me, I, I was remembering this morning that uh, perhaps the single worst day for President Calderon in office was the day that President Obama won the election. November 4, uh, the 4th of November, the year 2008. Uh, it was a terrible day for President Calderon. Uh, I was, uh, I'd been working for President Calderon for about six months, and that was a very busy day for me because I was looking at the election, monitoring the US election, because I was coming next day, very early in the morning, to brief President Calderon about the results of the election. We knew President that Barack Obama was going to win the election, but I wanted to, to, to make sure that I would explain him uh, the, I mean, the, uh, make a good analysis of the election. And uh, about 7.30 uh, p.m. Uh, in the night, uh, I was having a meeting with some people at Los Pinos, uh, the Mexican White House, and suddenly, I mean, I saw a lot of disappointment in faces. I, I was explaining them at an early meeting, I mean, the, I mean the, the, the outcome of the U.S. election, and suddenly, I mean, it was chaos in Los Pinos. Everybody left uh, without saying anything, uh, the, the, the meeting place, 
And Juan Camilo Murillo, the closest associate to President Calderón, just had died in a, in a plane accident in Mexico City. And uh, I still believe that it was an accident, but most Mexicans believe that he was assassinated. And uh, he was coming back from, from, from San Luis Potosí, uh, a 45 minutes flight uh, from a uh, little northern Mexico City. He was coming back and he had an accident, and uh, well, he died. And also the second man in command against the organized crime died there. So that's why people believe that, uh, that, uh, uh, that perhaps Juan Camilo Mourinho was assassinated. By all means, he was the closest uh, uh, person to President Calderón. He was chief of staff for the first year. But by then, he was already Secretary of the Gobernación, the Interior Minister. And in a way, Calderón was preparing him uh, for him to become his successor. He was, by all means, his closest uh, man. He was the strategist of President Calderón's campaign, and, uh, and Calderón was devastated, devastated. I came early next morning on November 5th to Calderón's office. At 7 a.m., I was already there with my oh, feeling mm, very weird because, I mean, the bad accident just happened, and uh, there was a lot of sadness in Los Pinos. And, uh, and, uh, but there was a possibility that Calderón could talk to President Obama at 9, 9, 9, 9 a.m. So well, Calderón was promptly there at a little after 8 in his office. Uh, I still wait for another 10 minutes for the foreign minister to come. And then she and I came to President Calderón, uh, to see President Calderón. The guy was devastated, as I told you. Uh, he had no sleep last night. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I could see what caliber of, guy, of a guy he was, because, I mean, being devastated, I mean, he absorbed the brief I gave him, and, uh, and he was ready at quarter to nine to talk to President Obama. I was the one, really, my job was to prepare President Calderon's talking points. And there was only one argument in the entire talking points uh, with President Obama, and it, it all was about trying to see Obama while Obama was going to be president-elect. The idea of President Calderon was, Barack Obama, I want to see you before you inaugurate. Uh, and it's not, it, there's few possibilities there because the transition in the US is only two months. The election is in November, and he, and he comes into office January 20th next year. And uh, well, they didn't talk that day. It was postponed at 24 hours. And uh, eventually they talk, and President Calderon told, told him, Barack, I would like to see you uh, before you inaugurate. And Barack Obama told him, President Calderon, uh, something like, uh, I owe the Mexican people. Uh, I'm here in the presidency, or I'm going to be president because of Mexicans. He told him so. I vividly remember um, he yeah, he, I mean, he didn't make a distinction on Latinos. I mean, he, usually he calls Latinos Mexicans at that point of, of time. And uh, so he was, I mean, he knew that because of Latino vote, he had become president of the US. And, and so he wanted to, to, to do something for Mexico. And well, it, it ended up happening that the only president, a foreign president that Obama will see before inaugurating it was President Calderon. We came to see President Obama to Washington January 11, just nine days before inauguration. And it was a, a very nice meeting. Uh, President Obama came to Mexican territory. He came to the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington, DC. And uh, he was supposed to come for one hour and a half, and he stayed there almost three hours, just nine days before inauguration. They really hit each other. They really like each other. Uh, President Calderon fully prepared for the meeting. I vividly remember Friday afternoon, Saturday, and half Sunday, because flew, we flew in into Washington so, Sunday afternoon. He was all the time with, with his English professor, a former British uh, journalist by the name John Moody, practicing his English, practicing his talking points. <laughs> Every single time he was talking to my office, he said, Rafael, uh, what do you mean with this? I, I was the one who wrote the talking points to him. And he really memorized the talking points. He wanted to make sure that he would have a hell of a meeting with President Obama. And they did. 
after lunch, I mean, when, when the, they, they gave a press conference and, uh, and uh, we were very happy, the Mexican delegation, I guess for two things. First of all, because they like each other. I mean, and President Calderon was telling us, you know, Barack and I, we discover that we have a lot of uh, things in common. First of all, he said, we're left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> Second, <laughs> we're lawyers. We're trained as lawyers. Third, we both went to Harvard. Fourth, we're married to these very tough women, and they are lawyers as well. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, Margarita and, uh, and Obama's wife, Michelle, they really like each other. They have become very good friends. Uh, the second thing, because of we were very happy because of the meeting, it was because we sent what we call a non-paper to, 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 to Obama's team. And basically, Obama has already made himself, and, and he was really uh, he was really studied our non-paper, and he was really uh, he not he not, not only liked what we sent him, but I would say he had already absorbed our ideas in how to improve U.S.-Mexican relations. At that point of time, I mean, really the bilateral relationship was in the sky. Uh, we thought that we could uh, get a lot of things gone, the done between Obama and Calderon. And unfortunately, I have to tell you today that, that we haven't been able to accomplish mo much. Why? Because of the US domestic hard times and because of Mexican domestic hard times. We didn't know at that time, January 11, the year 2009, that the US was coming into such a difficult moment and that Mexico will become as violent as it, it, it has become. So, what I would say, if I were going to write the talking points to President, uh, well, I don't know, I, I hope not Peña Nieto, so I would <laughs> tell you my preferences, but perhaps Josefina Vasquez Mota, that is a precandidate for the PAN, I would emphasize one thing more any other in writing the talking points for a meeting between her and I would say, uh, 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 Mr. Perry, but I know that I'm in Berkeley and I, should, and I should be politically correct, and I would say President Obama. But anyhow, the talking point I will write it will be about security, about stopping violence in Mexico, about stopping the spiral of violence in Mexico. What is what we have to do together to stop that? And a lot we have to do is to try to stop arms, American arms, for coming into Mexico. That, that would be a priority. We know it's almost impossible. We know that the Second Amendment here is too strong. We know that the gun lobby is super strong in the US. But anyhow, we will have to uh, pressure the US and to try to come up with something, because there's way too many arms in Mexico. I was uh, telling the, the students I was talking to them before, that Mexico, President, Cal the, 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 the President Calderon's uh, government has seized 135,000 uh, 135, weapons in these four years and a half. 90% of, of them coming from Mexico, a lot of bazookas, a lot of really huge weapons. We're not talking about a 22 caliber. You're really talking big weapons, something we have to do there. What else? The second, I was, the second thing that President Obama and President Calderon talk about in the Mexican Cultural Institute, it was about, uh, I would say, what we call it, the well-being of Mexicans and the well-being of Americans. And I believe a lot has to be done to improve the well-being of Americans and Mexicans. And a big part of the talking point, so children, you'll, be very, you'll be very proud of this, it was about health care. We believe that the US is undergoing a very important transformation of it, its healthcare system, Mexico as well. Uh, both reforms in Mexico and the US have the same goal. The goal is universal coverage. And what we were trying to do is to try to get some complementarity here and there. For example, now that Mexico has this Seguro Popular, by which almost every Mexican has, I mean, could see a doctor and could come to a hospital, for example, Someone in a Mexican in the US being very sick, he can always come back and get treatment in, in Mexico. Of course, if he's an illegal 
immigrant, he cannot come back to the US, but he will get better in Mexico if he, if he were to come to Mexico. We were also talking about, for example, there's about a little less than one million Americans living in Mexico, most of them retired people. And if it were possible to pay them Medicare in Mexico, we believe that about five million Americans will come to Mexico to retire. Why? Because medicine is much more expensive in Mexico, cheaper in Mexico. I'll tell you an anecdote. Today, a friend of mine, a journalist, Andres Oppenheimer, just quoted me in the Miami Herald. I didn't know and hardly just pointed out to me in class. And uh, but Andres Oppenheimer, no long ago, uh, actually in 2009, he was in Mexico. He was, ma he was making a TV interview with President Calderon. And, and he started to feel kind of weak during the interview. And, he, and, he, and I saw the interview, and he was kind of white, I mean, like uh, pale, I would put it that way. Well, Andres uh, went back to his hotel, and uh, he, was coming, he, he was going back to Miami the day after. And he said that he had a, a, a dinner with the rector, with the president of the National University of Mexico. But Andres felt so sick that he called the rector, the president, to cancel the meeting. But the rector told me, no, Andres, you cannot do me to, this to me. Uh, you criticize me. You criticize the National University in my book, and I want to come and see you because I want to explain to you what, what is the National University all about. It. So Andres said, well, I couldn't refuse the guy. And thanks that I couldn't refuse the guy, the guy saved my life. What happened is that the rector came. They went down to have dinner in, in, in Andres' uh, hotel. And when he tried to swallow the first, uh, 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 the first uh, piece of, of meat or whatever, uh, he just fainted. Apparently, his esophagus just exploded of Andres. He was very sick. He didn't know. He has been having a, a lot of uh, reflux uh, for three years. He, he didn't know. And he, OK, because the, this man was there, and he was an important man. They were able to get him in an ambulance to rush him into the hospital. They operated him. He was in Mexico, in one of the best hospitals in Mexico City for almost eight weeks. He recovered perfectly. When he came back to Miami, his health insurance gladly paid everything. And they say, you know, if you would have to have this in the US, it would have cost us six times what it cost you in Mexico City. And then Andres tells me, and you know, Rafael, I'm sure that in, in the US, I would not have had the same kind of help uh, that I had in Mexico, because all the nurses, all the staff were very nice to me. I was Andresito to everybody there. <laughs> I was very popular because I'm on TV. And, uh, and, I, and he's written now a lot about health care issues because he believes that there's a complementarity between the two systems. Sorry to go so long in that anecdote, but I, I guess he's telling about how could we complement each other. Uh, we talked about immigration, and we knew that we didn't have much chance to have, to have immigra immigration reform in the US, but still we have to talk about immigration. And President Calderon of that has become, I would say, he learned the lesson from President Fox. President Fox always spoke his mind talking about immigrants. And President Calderon has decided to become very responsible in the way he knows he should not talk to Congress or to congressmen, especially Republicans, about immigrants. Uh, and, uh, it has been very difficult on immigration. If I were to write the next, the, the talking point for, for the Mexican, the, me, the, the first female Mexican president <laughs> next year, I will say that, uh, I mean, we got to do something with the Mexican community and with the Latino community here. I'm very worried about the Latino community here, about the Mexican community here, because I will say, especially the immigrants, two Latino communities here, the immigrant community and the community already established here. The immigrant community is having a very bad time. Uh, I will echo what uh, Professor Doug Massey from Princeton kept on saying, they've been ma marginalized. And uh, it's amazing, uh, but something very important is happening nowadays between Mexico and the US. Since the 1930s, Mexican immigration to the US is approaching to zero. There's almost no immigrants coming. There's coming about 150,000 a year, but about that same of 
number of Mexicans are coming back to Mexico. Why are they coming back to Mexico? Because of hardships. Because in places like Alabama, they really treat it like criminals. So that's very bad. And, uh, and we must do something. I would say one, one of the big evidence to me that the US is, is in, in trouble, is, in, is, in, in, in hard, uh, is, hard, is facing a hard time, is because we can see that this new Latino immigrant community, they're not adjusting into the, the US society. They're not really becoming part of America. Why not? Well, because they, a lot of them cannot go to school. A lot of, I mean, you know, a lot of them cannot go to the univer to universities, and uh, it's it's very troublesome. And it seems to me that there's way in which Mexico and the U.S. could do something for this community. For example, I I really was giving hell the other day to, to an undersecretary of education in Mexico because you you will not to believe this, but Mexico is is very complicated for a for an immig a Mexican immigrant in the, in the US to come back to Mexico and get accreditation for his high school or her high school it's almost impossible it's stupid we have i mean Mexican universities should become very open and very flexible to recognize all the credits so let's absorb those Mexicans who cannot come here to uh, to school, and uh, but we still have this threat type problem that I hope we could overcome. Uh, so I, I would say a lot has to do about the well-being of the U.S. and the well-being of Mexico. Let me, I mean, let's stop to talk about the U.S. The second, if, and very close to first, priority for Mexico is, of course, the other neighbor, Central America. Uh, if Mexico is having problems, insecurity problems, if Mexico has become violent, is nothing in comparison to El Salvador or to Guatemala. Homicide rates in Guatemala or El Salvador are almost four times those of Mexico. It's chaos there. And uh, so Mexico must do something to help Central America, especially Guatemala, our neighbor. We have a, a thousand kilometer border with Guatemala and a, and a 200 kilometer border with, with, with Belize. And, uh, and, uh, and we have to put our act together in Central America. What we have been able to accomplish in Central America, it's we have a very interesting cooperation program with Central America that we call Proyecto Mesoamerica. Proyecto Mesoamerica comes out uh, the PPP, the Plan Puebla Panama. Yeah, and it, this is about co cooperating with Central America. And when President Calderón came into office, the Plan Puebla Panama, which was created by Fox, had about 100 initiatives, 100 priorities. So it didn't have priorities. It had everything was in there. It was like a Christmas tree with a little, <laughs> lot of things there. So President Calderón decided to just get rid of the Plan Puebla Panama and reinitiated the Proyecto Mesoamerica. And we decided to only have always less than 10 priorities. The most important about Plan Proyecto Mesoamerica is about roads in Central America. It's about energy. We finally were able to sell power, <coughs> electric power, to Guatemala. It took us 15 years to sell power to Guatemala. You don't going to believe this. Mexico has a surplus of power. Guatemala has a deficit, and we were unable to sell the power to Guatemala because of private interest in Guatemala. Finally, we're selling Guatemala about 12% of the power. It's much cheaper than Mexican power there and operates very well. But we have to overcome a lot of obstacles in Guatemala and also a lot of obstacles in Mexico. So we're finally doing that. And the single most important thing we have accomplished is still uh, the, to getting together, but we launched what we call the Mesoamerica Health uh, Institute. And this is a very interesting initiative because it's private and public. Two, fa two foundations, the Gates Foundation, already 20 minutes, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only like in, a four, in, the, in the first uh, 10 of my talk, no, <laughs> no not to work. Uh, the Gates Foundation put it out $50 million. The, the Slim Foundation put it out $50 million. The Spanish government, just before the crisis, put, put their $100 million. And it's 
is managed by, by, by the Inter-American Development Bank. We, got, we, we can do very good things there. I'll vividly remember in 2000, early, late 2009, uh, it was still raining in Honduras. And in this northern part of Honduras, they were having this, um, uh, they, were, they were going to face a, a, a problem. When a mosquito bites you, you get? Dengue. Dengue, dengue. How do you say dengue? Dengue? Dengue. dengue. It's a tropical uh, sickness. And uh, well, they were going to get, apparently, I mean, few thousands of Hondurans. Uh, I mean, almost, they say that there were at least 100,000 of Honduras of getting dengue. And Mexico was very helpful because we we'll, we'll, we'll on, only send uh, insecticide, <coughs> pesticides, and uh, it cost us the pesticides less than $100,000. And because of that few money, we were able to stop this dengue uh, problem in Honduras. So there's a lot of things we could do there, and I, it seems to me that that is where we really have to, to strengthen our act. Lately, we, we're facing a bad problem with Central America. We haven't been able to stop the abuses in Mexico with all the Central American transmigrants. There's a lot of Central American migrants crossing all the way through Mexico to come to the US, and, and there's huge abuses. The single most important one was last August last year when 72 migrants, most of them from Central America, were killed in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. There was not a, 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 a crime against migrants. It was a crime against, I would say, humanity, because also this year we find out that there's been killings like that, not only to Central American migrants in Durango, but also to Mexican migrants. This is about the Zetas, this is about fighting for territory of the gangs. But you can imagine how Central American countries feel about Mexico. We haven't been able to stop the violence against the, the migrants, and they feel very upset, and they should feel very upset. The third priority, I would say, to Mexico and Latin America, it, it's Brazil and Colombia. With Brazil, President Calderón try to negotiate a free trade agreement, but Lula I mean, when President Calderón told Lula in August 2010 about negotiating the free trade agreement, Lula told, see si Calderón. He always referred to him as Calderón with this very strong voice. Say, but only if we really accomplish a 21 century agreement. What Lula had in mind is to have a lot of cooperation, for example, between the two development banks. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to advance into that agreement because of one main obstacle, the Mexican private sector. And second, I would say some few people in the Calderon's cabinet that they, don't, that they hate Brazil. They feel in competition with Brazil. They, I don't know, they have this tiny vision. They don't have a vision, a global vision. And, uh, and yes, Mexican private sector is very scared, especially about Brazilian commodities, about Brazilian cattle, about Brazilian agricultural uh, exports. They very good Brazil on this. Seems to me if, the, if we were able to strengthen the economic relationship between Brazil and Mexico, the entire Latin America will, will see a, an important change. Mexico and Brazil are two thirds of the Latin American market. And if these two giants get together, we really can make the difference in Latin America, but it's proving difficult to do it. Then Colombia is very important, but let me go to my third priority in world affairs, which is East Asia, China. Mexico is losing to China. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, they're benefiting from China a lot because they they exporting a lot of commodities, they're exporting minerals, and they're exporting food. Unfortunately, Mexico is competing to China in the US market because we bought our exporters of ma manufacturing products, and we're not doing well. And China is really beating Mexico badly. We have a trade deficit of 42 billion with China. And China is not investing not even 1 million in Mexico. And now there's going to be problems because two weeks ago, President Calderón decided to, to see the Dalai Lama. Uh, something is for the US to see from President Obama to see the Dalai, Dalai Lama. But for Mexico, a weak country like Mexico, to see the Dalai Lama, you're really getting into trouble with China, with Beijing. 
I can tell you a little bit more about this, but that I didn't like. I, I, President Calderon made it out of principle. Yes, he's a religious leader. He's a peaceful leader. But still, China is China. And China is becoming the single most important market in the world. In 10 years from now, it will be, it will be the number one market. And we're going to miss the US. Because now we're going to have the first economy in the world being, an, of the, uh, of being le led by an authoritarian government. And we will see what it is to have a huge economy like China with an authoritarian government. I kept on telling my fellow, my fellow Mexicans, we all miss the US. We all miss the good, good old days. Finally, it's about, and that's what I think we have to improve a lot. Mexico, I would say, is a, is a reluctant middle global uh, power. Mexico should be a middle global power without reluctancy. Why so? Because we're champions in climate change, for example. It's for a country of the size of Mexico. It's much easier for us to be champions in climate change than for the US or to, or to China. It's easier for us. And we have been champions on this. In Cancun, we accomplished a lot. And, uh, and uh, but still, Mexico has some problems because we have so much domestic problems that because traditionally Mex Mexico was so much inward looking that we're still having problems. For example, no longer going. In the spring, I was visiting Australia. Wow, I mean, that's an active foreign policy. Wow. Australia is a key strategic military ally to the US and is immensely benefiting from trading with China. I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, a, a small country like Australia, well, it's a huge country with a small population, 20 million people, what they could accomplish. Seems to me that Mexico could do a lot in behaving like Australia, in behaving nowadays like South Korea. For example, Mexico is also one of the, I'll tell you, I finish with, an, with another anecdote, also by Andres Oppenheimer. Uh, Mexico has been part of the G20. Now the G20, in a way, is replacing the G8 as the single most important uh, coordinating forum uh, to stabilize the world economically and financially speaking. And uh, Mexico is part of this, as well as Brazil and Argentina. And, uh, and I remember being in the meeting of, G of the G20 in Pittsburgh. I was uh, in the lobby of the hotel. Uh, we only have three passes to go into the meeting. And of course, I, 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 I I, I only went when President Calderon needed me to change something in a point, talking point, or, he, or if he had a question about. He's always about statistics, so I was always. I mean, everybody in my office was really attentive to the computer because I'm sure that he was going to ask me for an impossible number. <laughs> and my people back in Mexico City, they, 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 I mean, they were there to try to find the number. But anyhow, I was there relaxing, and Andres Oppenheimer was covering the meeting, and he came. And he came and asked me, Rafael, why you're playing such a low profile in this G20 in Pittsburgh and Brazil, Lula is playing such a high profile? And I told Andres, I'll tell you why. <coughs> if you were inside, you will see that President Calderon is playing a very important role and Lula is very quiet. But Brazilians, they're very good for spinning, to give a spin to what Lula had to say inside the room. And basically, Brazil had a team of about 10 people outside talking to journalists and feeding them with what Lula has to say. We weren't doing that. And I'll tell you, that time I believe that Lula only spoke twice, and Calderon spoke like seven times. Lula, I mean, no confusions, Lula was a hell of a leader. He was a truly charismatic leader. I love the guy. But Lula didn't have the intelligence or the information or the mind of President Calderon. And in a meeting like that, Lula came and he gave two well thought remarks, very well prepared by his staff, and that's it. Calderon is someone who's able to think there. Uh, he saw, he saw someone so well informed, so well trained, uh, that he truly has distinguished himself in those meetings to be a leader, someone who truly comes with ideas and well prepared. Well, nobody knows about that part of Calderon because we have a terrible relationship with media. That has been a very weak side of President Calderon. Uh, 
let me just show you. I prepare uh, something about the election. Two minutes, just to to walk you about the candidates. Uh, I don't know how to use. I guess yeah. That this is. Could you see this? No. Okay. Uh, this is a summary of my presentation. I will say with the US, these are the four challenges security, economic partnership, well being of the population, and global and regional issues. We have to do a lot here, the US and Mexico. We really have to figure out how to deal with Venezuela, how to deal with Cuba. How to deal with Nicaragua? Mr. Ortega is really becoming a, a dictator in, 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 in uh, not, not him, his wife, I was told it, it's worse. The, the power behind the throne, it's Rosario Murillo, uh, and, uh, Mr. Ortega's wife. Uh, so this is, to me, the, the important challenge is coming for, uh, with the US. Central American security is is cooperation and it's about transmigration. Then uh, Brazil, we need to have this uh, advanced free trade agreement. Colombia, Colombia and Mexico, I mean, Latin America from here all the way to Mexico has become, is in crisis, is in this violent security crisis. And it's about this, it's Colombia and Mexico, the two countries could, could really put the, the, their act together and help Central America to overcome the crisis. We really need the Colombians in this. Uh, I told you already, Mexico is losing to China. We have to figure out how to better relate to China and to other Asian countries like South Korea. And finally, uh, Mexico is, as I told you, a reluctant middle power. These are the candidates. <laughs> This is my candidate, <laughs> the only woman there, woman there. And it's a, uh, uh, this is a, a boyish looking, good looking priesta. He's the former governor, Enrique Peña Nieto, the former governor of the state of Mexico. He just uh, finished his term in the state of Mexico, the single most uh, populous state of Mexico. And, uh, and Peña Nieto, as you can tell, I mean, 80% believe he's going to be uh, he's going to be the candidate for the PRI. This is internal party surveys. Okay? So 80% of priests believe that he's going to be the candidate. Uh, if you ask someone in Mexico who's going to be the next president, they will tell you Enrique Peña Nieto. He's been campaigning for the last three years. Uh, he's, uh, he's become the de facto candidate of Televisa. Televisa is this TV network station. It's a monopoly. Televisa, just listen to this. Televisa has 80% of the share of open television in Mexico. That's a true monopoly. And he's been the candidate of, the candidate of Televisa for the last two years. So that's why his polls are like this way. Uh, Manlio Fabio Beltrones, who is the head of the, uh, the, head of the free in the, in the Senate, but he's not getting there. And he's been, he was governor of, of Sonora. And as such, they say he was uh, close to the uh, drug dealers. I don't think so. Uh, there's a big gossip in Mexico that he cannot travel to the US. Wrong. Uh, I've been with him in a dinner in Austin, Texas, in the governor's mansion. So I, I know he has come to Mexico, to the US. Uh, OK, so this is the PRI, and they said to come back to Los Pinos. Okay. Uh, they were in Los Pinos for 70, 72 years, and now they, want to, they, they badly want to come back. They might be able to come back. They are already governing a lot of Mexico. 19 out of 32 states are governed by, govern, are governed by the PRI, so they might come. Uh, then you have the left. And you have Marcelo Ebrard and López Obrador. This is, Marcelo Ebrard has 53% and 
among voters. Uh, and López Obrador, 34%. The problem is that within his party, López Obrador is much stronger than Marcelo Ebrard. And we don't know if they're going to have a primary. I'm sure, I am sure they will not have a primary. The PRD, the leftist party in Mexico, is, the, is, is not the most democratic party in, in the world. And uh, all, all of us believe that in the end, López Obrador will be the candidate. And, Lopez, and it's going to be a pity because if Marcelo Ebrard, the current <coughs> mayor and governor of Mexico City, will become the candidate, he will have a chance to become president because he is very well seen by independents. We people of Mexico City like him a lot because he has done tremendous thing, things for the city. Mexico City has become a very liberal city. I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, it's, uh, there's gay marriage in Mexico City. There's bicycles in the streets. It's, it's uh, I, I, I would not say it's very safe, but it's safer <laughs> than other cities. And uh, it's becoming much better uh, under him. And he's someone that, in sharp contrast to López Obrador, he's someone who truly believes in a global world. He speaks English, which is important. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of an importance for him. I mean, just to think about a Mexican president not able to speak in English, the relationship with the US is going to be very complicated, I'll tell you. OK, uh, so it seems to me that he's going to be the candidate, and uh, because basically, I mean, he's, um, in his party, he has about 60% approval, and Marcelo goes down to 30. So, and he's the boss, López Obrador. So, so we'll see. Uh, but it seems to me, everybody thinks that, that López Obrador will prevail. And here is a big contest. Josefina Vázquez Mota, he was uh, the social develop, development minister for Mr. Fox. She's a tiny, John Lady with a lot of strength, President Calderon uh, decided to, I mean, she asked her for her resignation uh, because he was becoming too, too popular as education minister in Mexico of the federal government. And he went to Congress, and he has done very well in Congress, and now she's becoming the most popular within the PAN, but who knows? Santiago Krill, I don't think he has a chance. He's a senator. Uh, he was running against Calderón in 2006. Uh, we don't believe he has, a, he, has a, he has a chance. And this is the guy who replaced Juan Camilo Mourinho. Ernesto Cordero is the former Treasury Minister. He is the favorite of President Calderón. He just quit his position to become a, I mean, to try to improve his, his image. He's not growing, but who knows, because he has all the resources of the presidency. President Calderón is not like President Fox. President Fox was, he was not a politician. He was a, a, a Coca-Cola <laughs> businessman. And, uh, and, uh, and so he, I mean, he really, he was very nice uh, uh, to, his, uh, to his party, because when, when the, the primaries of PAN came, he really, I mean, he really participated there. President Calderón is very different. He's a man of power. He's a true politico. And as such, he's helping Mr. Cordero. Uh, I mean, he's not, I, I, I will, I, I, he's not really going against the law, but he's truly helping Mr. Cordero. All his, and the problem that Cordero has, I mean, he's a lovely guy. He's a graduate from ITAM, the university where I teach. He studied there mathematics, and then he went for a PhD to, pe to Penn State. He's an ABD all about dissertation. He couldn't complete his dissertation because then, he started to help President Calderón in his campaign. He was writing the, the, the important, uh, I would say, they wrote a very nice book about what, what was Calderón all about, and it was Cordero writing it. He's a very smart guy. He doesn't have charisma, and his problem is that he's too close to Calderón. I mean, that's his strength, and that's his weakness, that he's too close to Calderón. And Calderón now is still popular. He has 48% approval for going down, especially because he has two problems now, Calderón. Violence, number one, number two, and number three, and also economic hardship. I'll stop here, and I, sorry, I, I went much, I spoke for 40 minutes, and I wanted to talk for 20 minutes, but I, I'm here to entertain questions.
Are there any questions or comments? Yes. My question is going back to the relationship between Calderon and Obama. Uh, I was just reading in a recent article uh, in the New York Times where it talked about how many deportees under the Obama administration. And it's, it's almost like within this, with, without it even extending the full first term, it seems like he's going to exceed George W. Bush. I mean, yeah. Yes. He's already done so. <laughs> so what, what do you think about, what is your opinion of that, or if you have a comment? Because you talked about the good relations. And yeah. Well, uh, I would say uh, it's, it's very sad. Yeah, last year, uh, the U.S. deported a uh, little over 800,000 people. It was the the single most important deportation year uh, since the Great uh, Depression. And it's, it's very sad, I, I'll put it that way. And now, President Obama just a few months ago came with another ruling, and they say that they will not deport young people if they, uh, if they don't have a criminal record. Uh, but that is given a lot of discretion to the Homeland Security people. But they're trying to stop that because, yes, I mean, the criticism against Obama was overwhelming. Uh, yes, Obama on immigration issues has been a big disappointment, let's face it. We know he doesn't have now any more the political capital to go about reform, but he has done too little. And a lot of people feel disappointed. Yeah, when he was, once again, President Calderon calling him to congratulate President Obama for, for, for health care reform. The day health care reform passed, President Obama called President Obama. Calderon pre called President Obama, and he comes Obama, yes, Felipe. He always calls him <laughs> Felipe. Now they call, he calls him Felipe. So you know, I'm, thank you, Felipe, for your kind words. But unfortunately, about 20, 25 million people will not get coverage. And unfortunately, most of them are Mexicans. All the, the Im Mexican immigrants will not have coverage. So he's conscious of it. And at the same time, he's doing very little to change that. Uh, we understand that he's under a lot of uh, problems. But still, it's, it's a big disappointment. And that's why I was telling you that it's, it, it's amazing that there's so many Mexicans coming back to Mexico. Yes, the immigrant community is in, uh, is in trouble here. And I urge you, really, as students, as someone uh, close to the Latino community, to take a look at what's going on there. Latinos lost, in the 2009 Depression, about 60% of the wealth. Amazingly. It was the minority who lost the most, because of, a lot of them had bought houses, they didn't read, now they don't have a job, and they basically losing their houses. So it's very bad what is happening to the Latino community. I kept on uh, talking to people about this in Mexico, because we're not really aware of the suffering of the, of the immigrants here. I wouldn't say not all of the Latinos, but the immigrants. And, and it's very sad. And. Uh, but I guess, again, Latinos will vote for Obama because they don't have another choice. <laughs> uh, it's uh, but it's sad, yeah. And, and Obama is conscious. I mean, that, that's what is really hard for us because I, I mean, we know Obama understands things. We know, we know he understands the importance of Mexico. But President Calderon has become lately really frustrated with the man in Washington. Why so? Because, well, he cannot really deliver to Mexico. Uh, yes. Other questions, comments? Yes. Barry, no, from Australia, so I'll <laughs> your uh, comments. It is actually a very interesting comparison between Mexico and Australia, especially in the light of China's emergence as the, the most powerful, very soon to be the most powerful economy in the world. Australia has no advantage, of course, of not having a border with the United States. So, in a way, it's, um, that gives it a certain advantage. On the other hand, the emergence of China as its most important economic partner does present enormous obstacles, uh, contradictions and tensions to Australia because it may have to choose on strategic questions between 
you know, its traditional ally, the United States and uh, China. But my question was actually a different. I would also actually ask you a question about something different. While you were in a discussion with the students this afternoon, and while I was in the library reading up about Mexico, uh, Wall Street was collapsing. Uh, well, Once again. Give me the more. 450, 500 points collapsed. Now, we don't know that that may come back tomorrow, but it's a, it's a segue to an issue which um, is clearly a challenge to the world economy. Mexico is enormously dependent upon the United States. I wonder whether you would like, whether you could think, think through uh, the implications for Mexico of a double dip recession in the United States, a second dip, and simultaneously with a very major crisis uh, uh, in, in Europe, and maybe the signs of a slowdown of the Chinese economy. I know that's not asking as a tall order. But, uh, how is that, and that, what, what challenges does this pose for the uh, uh, Mexican economy and Mexican state in this upcoming crucial presidential year? Well, to put it bluntly, it, it, it's a nightmare for Mexico. It's, uh, in the 2009 crisis, uh, Mexican economy shrunk 6.3%. 6, 6 so we, we were badly hit by the U.S. Uh, uh, depression and uh, and uh, and we will be badly hitting again. Uh, we have recovered very very good in 2010 and this year because the the Mexican exports to the U.S. have, have peaked, uh, especially in the auto sector. There's been a lot, uh, and also in the airplane uh, industry, uh, but we're going to take a very bad hit because of it and it's. Uh, yeah, Me Mexico in the 1990s uh, decided to make a bet, and the bet was to become economically integrated with the U.S. That was what I mean. NAFTA was all about getting integrated with the U.S. and about exporting manufacturers to the U.S. Brazil made another bet; they decided to go South Americans and uh, and create a, a, a partnership with the four countries down there, Mercosur, and, uh, and Brazil didn't become a manufacturer export, uh, exporter, and now is benef benefiting greatly from China. If China went where to descend economically, you'll see the bad repercussions in, in, in South America, but still it's, it, it's hard for Mexico. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it was very difficult to, to, to foresee in the 1990s the level of, 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 of economic complications for the U.S., the level of chronic capitalism in Wall Street. I mean, let's be honest with this. And, uh, and uh, we don't have much uh, 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 room to, to move. Uh, what is important for Mexico is that Mexico is uh, an important uh, market in itself. There's 112 million Mexicans and growing. Uh, uh, one of the good things of Mexico is that we still have a young population. Average age in Mexico is 26 years old, so 26 years. And, and the US has also benefited tremendously of having so many Latinos here. That's why your population is still growing a lot. And in that, in that terms, it's much uh, stronger and healthier than European societies. Uh, but it's going to be hard for Mexico. We have to diversify. It's not easy, and uh, Mexican firms are doing quite well now in Central America, but we're not quite at speed there, and uh, so we will have to, to adjust. Uh, uh, I mean, we already endured the 2009 crisis. We'll see what's, what's happening next year. That will have a lot of effects in the election. Again, I mean, apparently a bad economy will hit the party power, I don't know really, because if something Calderón could brag about is about having very good public finances. The reason Mexico now is growing at 3.5, 3.7, we were going to grow in 4.5 now, is because public finances are in order in Mexico. We learned the bad way in Mexico. We have in the 60s, in the 70s and 90s, a lot of economic crisis. So we learned the bad way, and now we don't play around with macroeconomics. 
We don't play around with public finances. Mexico is very healthy, financially speaking. We have a lot of reserves, and we, have a, we don't have a, a fiscal deficit. We have a fiscal surplus. I mean, we're very uh, disciplined on that, and President Calderón has been extremely disciplined on that. You can bet that he's disciplined, I'll, I'll tell you another. And I mean, he's someone, I mean, one of the, the things that I like about him the most is that he's someone that spends public money at the mo as if the money was coming out of his pocket. I'll give you an example. When uh, we were celebrating that we saw Obama in January 11, 2009, we were driving, I mean, the convoy, we were going to Andrew, Andrews, uh, Andrews uh, Air Force Base. And because President Calderon uh, spent too much time with Mexican media, I mean, we lost our slot, so we had to wait someplace for another hour because we lost our spot. So we decided to, to stop in a restaurant, eight, nine of us, perhaps less seven of us. And, uh, and President Calderon said, well, I feel that, uh, to have a very nice, uh, good, uh, good red wine. And the Mexican ambassador to, to, to the US, Arturo Sarucan, he orders these two very nice bottles of wines. President Calderon saw the wine, Spanish wine, and said, wow, ambassador, this is a very expensive wine. And then pres uh, the ambassador told him, so, well, President, if you want me, I will pay it out of my pocket. And President, Calderon, and President Calderon said, no, no, it's fine. I mean, we'll celebrate, OK? They served us wine, and I was so tired. I just wanted to come into the plane, have two shots of tequila, <laughs> and collapse, <laughs> and I didn't want wine. <laughs> so they, I mean, I really like wine, but I decided not to drink. I was exhausted. I mean, like three hours without sleeping. OK. I didn't drink my wine. We're leaving, and President Calderón told me, hey, Rafael, drink your wine. This is a very expensive wine. Come on, toss with me. And he made me drink my wine. <laughs> so I can tell you a lot about a guy. In the, in the Mexican Air Force, uh, in the Mexican uh, P-01, which is uh, say, Air Force One or Air Force One. I was just only a 757. And for example, in going to Uganda, we went to Uganda in uh, last uh, summer, we stopped three times. <laughs> we stopped in Boston, <laughs> then in Sevilla, Spain, and then we went to Kuala Lumpur. I mean, it's hell to, 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 to go into that airplane. But anyhow, they used to have, for example, these very expensive uh, uh, bottles of, of whiskey. President said, no way. I don't want that. I mean, he asked us when we're traveling with him, Hey, you, uh, you guys want to have some uh, wine? And usually going into place, I, we never drink because, I mean, we're on call 24 hours. In coming back, it's, it's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one else is going to drink wine with him, he will not open the, the bottle of wine because he really treats the money and the public uh, uh, monies like if, if it were his, and he's a bit stingy, you say that, <laughs> and I'm glad he's that way. Just imagine having the PRI coming back to Los Pinos. I know that's on me, but I mean, they're very different. When you go to a Calderon birthday party, always there's a little poor room there, and it says who's paying for the carnitas, for the chicharrones, <laughs> for the drinks, yes, yeah? It's not public money, which is very nice. I'm not telling you that there's no, yes, of course, there's corruption in Mexico. In Mexico, there's a lot of corruption, but very little at the federal level, I would say. I would put it that way. I mean, I really want to think that President Calderon is a, is a very honest man. I mean, it's, I don't see it the other way. I mean, the way, he's, the way he spends the money, the way he treats Mexico, it's, it's, uh, it's very sad that we're really going into this spiral of violence lately. Because, yeah, a lot of people is blaming him. And he, yeah, he's, he's responsible for it. But he's someone who has tried very hard, who might need to improve the strategy. But I'll tell you, he's a guy of principle, sometimes of too much principle. That's why he saw the Dalai Lama. I think that is a mistake, because foreign policy about, it's not about principle. It's about interests. Uh, but anyhow, I. I I, I, I want to share those anecdotes. I, I left the office of President Calderon last March, and uh, I left on a very difficult 
moment in U.S.-Mexican relations because he decided to get rid of Carlos Pascual, the then ambassador to Mexico, and I, and I opposed it to him openly. No, not openly because I was a staff, but he knew from the very start that I didn't like that idea. I guess in the end he was right. When you don't trust an ambassador, you better tell your counterpart and let him know that you don't want him anymore. And that, uh, well, the U.S. withdraw Carlos Pascual. We have a new ambassador in Mexico. And, uh, and uh, but he's, I mean, he's a tough guy. He, he takes bold, bold decisions. And lately, I could say he's becoming a bit nationalistic with the U.S. because out of, out of frustration and out of politics, because politics are coming. Uh, we uh, have time for one more question, very briefly. I just have a brief economic comment on what Rafael just said. The good news is that, as you mentioned, in 2009, uh, the Mexican economy did collapse by 6%, which was significantly worse than the U.S. economy, but caused by the U.S. collapse. In 2010, Mexico recovered faster, and Mexico's recovery helped the U.S. as a, a stimulus package to this economy. Uh, that said, I was just on a, a radio program several days ago on where the U.S. economy was going, and the person who preceded me was from the Anderson Report at University of California, Los Angeles, which is a very highly regarded set of economic projections about the state of California. Uh, and the first question he was asked was, <clears throat> will California slip into the double dip of a double dip recession? And he said instantly, no, not a chance. So I'm thinking, that's kind of optimistic. He wasn't being facetious. He said, we never left the first recession. <laughs> so that was both accurate and troubling. The unemployment here is over 12%. If you look at the number of people in the state who are looking for a full-time job, it's 25% of the workforce. So one more quick question. Yes? Um, I'm really interested in kind of these shifty relationships between countries in Latin America. You mentioned that it's really attractive to Mexico to have some sort of alliance with Brazil. Um, at the same time, I mean, Brazil is already just, you know, over its limits in South America, and I think a lot of countries are kind of starting to reel from that. What do you think the implications would be for Latin America if, you know, Mexico and Brazil really kind of got serious about that? Well, I, 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 I truly believe that if we really partnership with Brazil, that could make a difference in, in, in Latin America. It's, uh, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of obstacles. The first is the distance. I mean, Brazil is very far away from Mexico. It's, it takes 11, 10 hours, 11 hours to fly from Mexico City to, to Sao Paulo. It's, it's, it's far and away. And, uh, and then we don't have much economic uh, uh, exchanges. I mean, the trade both ways is about is, is approaching $4 billion. Uh, and then with the US, you're talking about almost $300 billion, just to give you a. Uh, but I believe that the, the potential is there, it's enormous. And, uh, and, and one of the obstacles is the Mexican foreign policy apparatus, especially the Mexican foreign, foreign ministry, as well as Brazilian foreign ministry. My friend, uh, the foreign policy advisor to President Lula, uh, Marco Aurelio Garcia, and a, a very influential guy, not like me. I really, I mean, I, I did the talking points, I did the briefings, but I was not really influential in terms of, I, 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 I did not compete with the Mexican foreign ministry. I, I'm being honest. I mean, President Calderon on this, I mean, he's very traditional. The minister was the minister and I was the staff. No questions about it, no, no doubts about it. Marco Aurelio Garcia was very influential. He was really the one calling the shots in Latin American foreign policy for, for Lula. And he, just to tell me, Rafael, our problem are our foreign ministries and ministers. A last anecdote, and I finish with this. Mr. Amorin, the, the, who was a foreign minister for, for, for Lula, the last time that Lula and Calderon got together, uh, I was very lucky because they decided to do a meeting, uh, they call it 
1 más 3, that means 1 plus 3, that means that the president and three ministers. And there were in our delegation three ministers, foreign affairs, trade, and energy. So I was out of the question. I really wanted to, to listen to Lula and to see these changes. But I was lucky because the, the translator to Lula into Spanish, she was Mexican, and President Calderón knew her. So President Calderón dropped his translator and he asked me, come with me, come with us. And and uh, and, uh, and do the uh, and do the writing, the, the be the note taker. So I was very happy because that was one of the important meetings of the of Calderón presidency. And Lula uh, told Calderón, "Oye, Calderón, always talking like this. We should meet twice a year. But but I hate to meet you in New York in the UN. No, what I mean is, besides if we meet in New York or we meet whatever." Because sometimes when you have a multilateral meeting, you just have these bilateral meetings. He told President Calderon, why don't we agree and, and that you should come to Brazil every year, once a year at least, and I will go to Mexico once a year. So then we'll have two bilaterals every year. OK, I took notes. Half a minute, of, uh, I mean, when we finish the meeting, we'll put in together the, 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 the joint communique, uh, the press relief. Uh, well, I was talking to the president, I said, we should underline this, this is very important, that they're going to, the guys agreed to get together twice a year. And Maureen said, no, you misunderstood, only once a year. And I couldn't fight it, the foreign minister. We ended up putting in the press release only once a year. You know, it was him really obstacling Mexico to become closer to Brazil, I mean, bureaucrats are like that. You had a question. You want to say something? No, Come on. That's more a comment about an optimistic comment about the health reform. That the implementation is going to start in 2014, so we still have some chances because um, uh, it's not that they are not going to be insured, but we have to pay more because everybody has to be insured. The only thing is that undocumented immigrants will not benefit from the subsidized packages, the exchange, that the others will benefit. But still a lot of being implemented. And for instance, in California, we are moving forward to, towards um, those things. So that's the optimistic way. And the fact that you said many um, baby boomers are going to retire in Mexico. And if, if the economy goes to a second collapse or have not gone to <laughs> You know, it's going to be even more attractive because what they are going to be living here will not allow them to have uh, decent health uh, care. And better for us to begin to work that really by national. If not, the offer will be harm the services in Mexico a lot because we will be competing with demand on dollars. Our Mexican doctors serving the expatriates here in areas that are really uh, don't need that. But we can do it. Thanks, Sochi. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, and thanks, you, Rafael, for being with us. Today.